And it's a pleasure to welcome back, welcome back, back Shuli. And I really want to thank her. This is the uh, her concluding class. I think it's been a, a 10 week series, another uh, wonderful series. Of course, we look forward to learning her first next week. Um, she will be giving a separate class, if you want to call it, on um, Paro leaving Egypt, Egypt and the Exodus and archaeology, a special pre Pesach class next Thursday, same time. But this is the end of her. Uh, you know, the current series, and of course, I think the topic for today, Shibat Zion, is most uh, appropriate. I think Shuli will be taking uh, a break between Pesach and Shavuot, but, but please, God, we'll have her back, you know, in the not-too-distant future, and I want to thank her, and uh, on behalf of everybody here, uh, express our gratitude for Torn Motion and for around the world for all the people who benefit from your excitement and your knowledge and your, your presentation. So Truly, thank you. too long a break. Okay, thank okay. You. And with that, with that, everybody should mute themselves and we can put mute your yourselves. Mute and at one o'clock when the class is over, everybody can unmute themselves and say all the thank yous and uh, whatever. That would uh, be nice. Okay, everybody. Thank you. And Shuli Bakasha. Okay, hi everybody. So we are going to do our concluding class, and I'm actually very happy that we're concluding with this as opposed to with um, with the last class, with the destruction class. That was kind of a depressing way to end. Um, why is my thing not working here? Hold on, let's try it again. Um, but now we're going to do Shivat Zion, which we will see is not a simple time period, but it is a time period that has. Uh, I don't know why my my Zoom is not working. My um, it has a it has so much potential and so much optimism about it. Um, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop sharing. I'm going to open up my PowerPoint again, and we will try it one more time. Sorry, everybody, for technical difficulties. Okay, uh, 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 okay, let's do this again. Sources are here. Very nice. No, you know what? Actually, sorry. Okay. Um, yes, that's what I will do. Beautiful. And share screen. Yes, still not showing the slideshow. All right, it's showing the pictures though, right? You're seeing the pictures? Yeah, yeah, yeah. we see. For some reason, it is not allowing me to do slideshow. I don't know why, um, but we'll do it this way until I can figure it out. Um, no, 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 that is not what I want to do. Ah, okay, good. Here we go. Sorry. Technology is, uh, I, I live in the past. Um, okay, here we go. Um, so the big picture of the story first, we're going to do a, a little bit what we didn't get to last time, which is kind of the tail end of the destruction of the first temple. But the big picture of what we're going to talk about now is Shivat Zion, is the Persian period, is the return, hey, which on the one hand happens very quickly, right? We have a very short time between the destruction of the first temple and the beginning of the rebuilding, Jeremiah's prophecy of 70 years. It actually begins even earlier than that. Um, so on the one hand, it's very quick. On the other hand, it is very difficult. It is not an easy time period. And we're going to see a theme of these last Nevi'im, the last three prophecies prophets, Chagai, Zechariah, and Melachi, is going to be about how you have to look past the obstacles that you are seeing today uh, to what we know, say the prophets, is going to be a brighter future. Um, and we're going to talk about those themes as we go along. Um, one of the things that's very powerful, and we won't go into it too deeply, but it's very important to remember is that for an ancient peoples to return to their land after they have been exiled uh, is very, very unusual, right? When we think about the other ancient peoples that the children of Israel shared the land with before the exile, right? The Philistines uh, or the Canaanites, right? Jebusites, all these people, once the, the destruction happens, okay, the Arameans, once the exile happens, that's it. They essentially cease to exist as a people. It's not that they don't exist anymore in the world. There are individual Philistines 
Philistines in the world. There are individual Canaanites in the world, but as a nation, they do not reconstitute themselves. And for the Judeans to actually remain, first of all, as a nation in the, the exile, and second, to come back, right? To come back and to reconstitute themselves as a nation in their own land, that's a very unusual thing, okay? Uh, and, and we'll talk maybe a little bit about why that happens. Um, we're gonna talk about the challenges of the Shivatsion period. We're also gonna talk about the challenges from the perspective of the modern times, challenges of the historian and the archeologist. There is not a lot from this time period, okay? Neither archeologically nor in literature. And, and there's a lot that we have to fill in. The beginning period, we have literature, we still don't have a lot of archaeology. And then we have kind of a black hole, and we'll talk about that. Okay, the picture that we're looking at, we're going to come back to it a little bit later. Uh, this is called Kivrei HaNevi'im, or the Tombs of the Prophets. Uh, it is at almost at the top of the Mount of Olives. It's actually in the backyard of a uh, of a Muslim Arab who, who lives in Jerusalem, uh, who lives right here. And he's the caretaker uh, of this tomb. Is it the tomb of the prophets or not? Uh, I will leave you in suspense for another 10 minutes or so. Spoiler, it's not, okay? But we'll talk about why. Okay, so um, to go back to what we did not really complete last time, okay? Uh, on the one hand, we have the exile. We have two exiles, right? We had the, the exile of the elite of the Harash of Mazger in 597. Then we have the larger exile in 586. We have the destruction of the temple. But uh, the Babylonians want some people to stay on, right? Unlike the Assyrians who do a transfer of populations, who get rid of the locals and bring in other people to farm the land. And unlike the Persians, as we're going to see, who repatriate people to their countries, the Babylonians basically want to exile everybody. They want to get rid of any nationalism or any rebellion but they still would like some people to stick around in order to farm the land and to pay some taxes, right? So we have a group that stays behind. Now, this group is based mostly in the area of Binyamin, of the tribe of Benjamin, a little bit north of Jerusalem. Okay? And it seems from like hints that we can get in the book of Jeremiah that Binyamin is more on the side of accommodationist, want to make peace with the Babylonians, don't necessarily want to rebel. And so the, the Babylonians appoint a governor okay? and they put him up in a place called Mitzpah. Okay, now the governor we know is a guy named Gedalia. Okay, uh, Gedalia ben Achikam. He is from the Shafan family, who are a family that mostly are loyal to God as opposed to the bad kings like Yehoiakim. Okay, Gedalia is appointed to be the governor um, and Yirmiyahu is still around, right? He doesn't go into exile with the people. Uh, and the place that they go is a place called Mitzpah. Now, Mitzpah, there were different uh, possibilities of where it was in the last hundred years of biblical archaeology. Today, uh, many archaeologists believe it is what you see in the picture here, Nebi Samuel, uh, which is very logical because it is a Mitzpah. Mitzpah literally means a, play, a lookout point. Uh, and Nebi Samuel is the highest point uh, just north of Jerusalem. Uh, and recently, we have found in excavations layers that go back Back to biblical times, so it makes sense that this is actually a biblical site. And Mitzpah is important in other times in Tanakh. We're going to focus on Gedalia, okay? Uh, and Gedalia becomes the governor, and he says, "Don't worry, I'm going to help you. I'm going to support you, right?" And that's what we have here at the end of the book of Jeremiah. All right, so Jeremiah came to Gedaliah, son of Achikam at Mitzpah, and stayed with him among the people who were left in the land. The officers of the troops and their men with them heard that the king of Babylon had put Gedaliah in charge of the reason, and that he had put in his charge the men, women, and children of the poorest in the land, the Lataaretz. Remember that. That's the people who stay behind. Those who had not been exiled to Babylon, meaning all the elites, all the rich people, all the people who have some kind of a skill or a profession, they're gone. These are the poorest, right? So they went with their men to come to Gedaliah at Mitzpah, Ishmael, son of Netanyah, 
Okay, we're going to hear about him in a moment. Yochanan and Yonatan, the sons of Kireach, et cetera, et cetera. Gedaliah, son of Achikam, son of Shaphan, reassured them, saying, do not be afraid to serve the Chaldeans, right, the Babylonians. Stay in the land, serve the king of Babylon. It will go with, well with you. I am going to stay in Mitzpah to attend upon the Chaldeans who will stay with us, right? Don't worry. Everything's going to be okay. I'm going to support you. I'm going to help you, right? And, and here's where we get to the reason why we have a fast for Gedaliah and not for any of the other, unfortunately, many assassinations that we have in Jewish history, even at this point where things are so terrible and only this remnant is left behind, there still is dissension, there still is division. And along comes this aforementioned Ishmael ben Netanya. Okay, he's jealous, he's from the royal family. Who's this Gedalia? He's just from a family of scribes and servants. And he comes and he plots an assassination. And he comes and he assassinates Gedalia in the seventh month. Ishmael, son of Netanya, son of Elishama, who was of royal descent and one of the king's commanders, came with 10 men to Gedalia. And he and the 10 men who were with him arose and struck down Gedalia and killed him because the king of Babylon had put him in charge of the land. Ishmael also killed all the Judeans who were with him, right? And it goes on in a terrible way. People are coming. They haven't heard yet that the temple has been destroyed. And they're coming with offerings to bring to the Mikdash. And on the way, on the way, right? This terrible uh, story here. The second day after Gedaliah was killed, when no one yet knew about it, 80 men came from Shechem, Shiloh, and Samaria. Their beards shaved, their garments torn, their bodies gashed, carrying meal offerings and frankincense to present at the house of the Lord, right? You can imagine the scene. This is, of course, centuries before any kind of way to pass on information except for messengers. Here we are. It's the seventh month. It's Tishrei, right? When was the temple destroyed? In Av, two months before. The news hasn't reached everybody. And these people have set out on a journey to come to the temple. And on the way, as they come closer to Jerusalem, they're told about the destruction of the temple and they tear their clothes and they shave their heads. And this is a very, very terrible moment. And then they come to Mitzpah crying and Yishmael comes and he murders them uh, and he throws their body into a cistern, right? Terrible, terrible ending. And then there's a battle and they are attacked. Uh, the, the assassins are attacked by someone who is loyal to Gedaliah, Yohanan, the son of Kereach. Yishmael runs away, right? Uh, but Everybody else essentially tries to see what they should do. They consult with Jeremiah. Jeremiah consults with God. God says, stay in the land. Jeremiah says, stay in the land. And everybody says, oh, no, 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 we're not staying in the land. And they pick themselves up and they go to Egypt. Now, when I was in elementary school, and I'm guessing a lot of people here heard the same story, the, the thought was, OK, Gedalia is assassinated. Everybody picks themselves up. Last guy out, turns out the lights, and that's it. And nobody is in the land of Israel for the next 70 years. It's not really what happens. Yes, the story of Gedalia is a terrible story, and it's a watershed moment in Jewish history, uh, an assassination, an assassination after all of these awful events and leaving the land. But many people do stay behind. And we know this from archaeology. We know that there are still settlements, particularly in the area of Benjamin, and this is going to lay the groundwork for what we're going to see in a few minutes, the conflict between those who were exiled and those who stayed behind. So keep that in the back of your minds. Meanwhile, we're going to travel to Babylonia, right? The exiles, of course, go to, are taken to Babylonia, to the land between the rivers, right? And they settle between the rivers here. Uh, and we have a fascinating, fascinating testimony to what happens to them, right? We have, and we're going to see it in a minute, the, the chapter in Psalms by the rivers of Babylon, on the Harot Babel, how they say, you know, how, how they have to keep on remembering the temple and they can't sing and they want to return and I'll never forget Jerusalem. But we also have a different testimony. Now, these strange little things, which look a little bit like, I don't know, large pieces of cereal, okay, they are actually clay tablets um, that mysteriously appeared on the antiquities market in the 70s, right? This is a very big problem in archaeology, uh, things that don't have what are called provenance. We don't know where they came from, okay? Um, but they are written in cuneiform letters, okay? They are written in Akkadian with some Aramaic and Hebrew, and we can date them, right, based on the writing. We can date them to the first hundred years of the exile, okay? Because the, they have dates, right? They have dates on them because there are a lot of business 
business contracts and, and letters that are written here. And the dates are 572 BCE to 477, okay? So this is really those first, first years uh, of the exile. And what they show us, and this is what's truly fascinating, they show us that the Jews kept their Jewish names, right? We have a lot of the names here. Uh, we have names of the people who are here uh, and they um, and they kept their names and they keep Shabbat, okay? We have contracts that are written and they're never written on Shabbat. We also hear about their professions and some of it is digging canals by the rivers. So they literally are by the rivers of Babylon. Now, this is an amazing okay. insight, right? Because it shows us here are these people, they've taken very far away from home. Their temple has been destroyed most people would just kind of assimilate into their new surroundings, but that's not what these Jews did. They retained their names, they retained their calendar, they held on to who they were. And because of that, when the news comes uh, 70 years later, 50 years later that you can go back, not all of them go back, but some of them do. And besides that, the ones who don't go back, the ones who stay on in Babylonia, they keep their Jewish identity. So it's a fascinating testimony to something that we really knew already. Um, now, it doesn't tell us why. Right? It doesn't tell us why this happened. But perhaps one of the, the causes for why they're able to, to keep their identity alive is because they remain singing about Sion, right? And we all know the very, very famous uh, Tehillim, uh, Kuflam and Zion, Psalm 137, uh, by the rivers of Babylon, we sat and wept as we remembered Zion. There on the poplars, we hung our lyres, right? The captors asked us to sing songs of Zion. How can we sing a song of the Lord on alien soil? If I forget you, Jerusalem, let my right hand wither, let my tongue stick to my palate. If I cease to think of you, if I do not keep Jerusalem in my memory, even at my happiest hour. So there's this commitment to remembering Jerusalem, to remembering the temple. Um, and, and there's even a suggestion that they say we can't sing the Lord's songs, but they do. They do sing about Jerusalem. They do remember Jerusalem through their songs, through their poetry, through their memory. And that helps them when we have this amazing turnaround, this amazing reversal, okay? The Babylonian empire falls soon after the, the capture of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple. The new empire, uh, the new rulers are the Persians. Uh, and the Persians led by King Cyrus, Koresh in Hebrew, have a very different policy, okay? As opposed to the Assyrians and the Babylonians, they want to repatriate the nations that they have conquered. What's the idea? Okay, the idea is that each of these nations will go back to their place, right? And they will rebuild their temples and they will not only worship their own gods, but they'll also pray for the king of Persia, right? For the emperor Cyrus. And that's a fascinating twist in the, in the theology here that they really do believe that all of these nations are gonna pray for them and that will be good, right? Now we have this written, it's so important, it's so significant that our texts tell us about it twice. Okay, we hear about it in the book of Ezra and we have the exact same passage in the book of Chronicles and right? This is how the book of Ezra begins. In the first year of King Cyrus of Persia, when the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah was fulfilled, right? Remember, what does Jeremiah say? He says there's going to be, he, he says this as kind of, you better settle into Babylonia because you're going to be there for 70 years, right? It's a long time. You're not coming back tomorrow. For those of us who, you know, for all of us who are living through a much, much longer exile, we say 70 years, that's very, very short. But for them, it was very, very long, right? Uh, when the word of the Lord was fulfilled, the Lord roused the spirit of King Cyrus of Persia to issue a proclamation throughout his realm by word of mouth and in writing as follows, right? And this is the writing, by the way. We have three of these, what are called Cyrus cylinders, obviously written in cuneiform, as you can see it here. Um, which say more or less what this says. It doesn't speak specifically of the Jews. It says all the peoples can go back to their lands, but we have it, of course, specifically about the Jews. Thus said King Cyrus of Persia, the Lord God of heaven has given me all the kingdoms of the earth and has charged me with building him a house in Jerusalem and Judah. Any one of you of all his people, may his God be with him. Let him go up to Jerusalem that is in Judah and build the house of the Lord, God of Israel, the God in Jerusalem, and all who stay behind wherever he may be living, let the people of his place assist him with silver, gold, goods, livestock, besides the freewill offering to the house of 
God that is in Jerusalem. So the chiefs of the clans of Judah and Benjamin and the priests and the Levites, all whose spirit had been roused by God, got ready to go build the house of the Lord that is in Jerusalem. Who goes, right? Who's in this first wave? Okay, we're going to see a timeline in a minute. The first wave is not Ezra and Nehemiah. The first wave are royalty grandsons of King Yehoiachin, if you recall, he was exiled, right? Someone named Shesh Batsar, someone named Zubavel ben Sha'altiel, as well as a Kohen, right? You have the royal line, the line of David, and you also have a Kohen named Yehoshua ben Yehotzadak. Those are the leaders, and you have people going back, and we have this actually fascinating list of the people and the genealogy in the book of Ezra. But what's important to understand also is it's not a lot of people, right? It's maybe 10% of the people. Most people stay behind, okay? Most people stay behind. Let's do a little bit of the timeline. Just be aware, this is kind of a traditional timeline. The Persian kings are very confusing. This is a very complex subject in biblical chronology. Who is Ahasuerus? Was there an Ahasuerus? How does he fit in with the Dariuses? How do they all fit in with the kings in the book of Daniel? We're going to look at it kind of in the traditional way of looking at it and, and the bigger picture just to get a sense, but, but recognize that this is a complicated topic. Um, okay, so we have our major dates, 586, the destruction of the temple, right? The way this is done is you have dates, you have the foreign king, the prophet and the Jewish leader, and the major event. So you have this all in your source sheet. So if this this is helpful to you, print it out and take it with you wherever you go. Okay, so 586, we have the destruction of the temple and the, the leaders, of course, uh, the, the prophet is Yirmiyahu, as well as the king Tzedekiah, Tzedekiah. Uh, what I didn't put in here is Ezekiel, Yechezkel, who's also a prophet at the time. Okay, 539, the proclamation of Cyrus the Great, you can return, and we have Shesh Batsar, and, uh, and we have Zerubbabel, they start to return, 539, 538. The first, one of the first things they do is to begin work on the foundations of the Second Temple, okay? We're going to see that that work is stopped, Okay. There are letters that are written to the Persian kings, letters uh, against the Jews from their enemies, from those who stayed behind, saying, oh, they're really inciting against you and they're rebellious. And the work is stopped for almost 20 years, started again with Darius. And that's our time period of Haggai and Zachariah, maybe Malachi. He's a questionable. We don't know exactly when he is. Eventually in 516, and this is our nice 70 years, right? 516, the temple is dedicated some point around here, we have the story of Purim. And like I said, it's a question when it is exactly. After that, okay, almost 100 years later, after the beginning of the return, 458, we have Ezra, 445, we have Nehemiah. Okay, so they are the, the second wave. Okay, uh, and we're going to see what their challenges are and what they do. And from then, we have a black hole, we don't know anything, we don't have almost any literature until we have Alexander the Great in 333. Okay, so we have a century, more than a century, where we know very little about what's going on. And in reality, even that, we don't know very much until the time of the Maccabees, until the 160s, until the, the second century before the Common Era. So there's a lot of empty space uh, and information that we are lacking that we just don't know about. Okay, and we'll come back to that. Um, the Persians name the province that they are ruling Yehud or Yahad, right? Yud Hey Dalid. Um, and it's an interesting question where this is, what this includes exactly, right? First of all, just to understand something, okay, for the Persians, uh, the this province is actually very important, right? This whole area of the land of Israel is important. We are always important, not for ourselves, but for how we connect to other places. Same thing with the Romans, okay? The Persians, who are, of course, over here to the east, right? They do not have an outlet to the Mediterranean Sea, okay? They are allies with the Phoenicians over here, right, on the coast. So they need things to be nice and quiet in this area of Yehud, of Judea, so that they can travel back and forth across to the sea. They also want to have access to Egypt down here. So they want things to be peaceful. They want everything to go nicely and to have good allies in Yehud. Okay? And that's why when the first little peep of maybe they're rebelling is heard, they're very quick to shut things down. They, they want to have order here. Now, um, 
what is the area that this includes? So we're going to see that we have quite a lot of proofs that it's this area of uh, Binyamin, right, north of Jerusalem. Here, let's just find Jerusalem on our map here so we can have a sense of where things are, right? Here's Beit Lechem. Here's Jerusalem. Okay, so we have this whole area of Binyamin to the north of Jerusalem, as well as an area south of Jerusalem. What about the rest of the country, right? Or I'll show you in a minute why we think this is the area of Yehud. What about the rest of the country? So according to, at least it seems according to archaeology, this is the area that settled for the first good few hundred years, really up until the Hasmonean period. This is the area of uh, of where the Jews resettle. And it's only later, right? It's only in the Hellenistic period, right? From Alexander the Great and on that Jewish settlement expands further to the north and the south of the country. Okay? The south takes even longer. Um, there is a contrary opinion. Hey, Rabbi Olbin Nun, very, very important Bible scholar, uh, says that we talk in the, in the Gemara all the time about the borders of Ole Bavel, right? Those who return from Babylonia, uh, and that's very important for Halakha, right? What, what, is, uh, what are the borders of the land according to those who returned? And is that included in, in Shemitah, in Maser, and all different kinds of things like that? And he says, if it's only this small area, the borders of Ole Bavel, that, that, that includes almost nothing. So he says, nah, the reason we only hear about this area in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah is because the focus is on Jerusalem, but people did settle in other places. However, most of the archeology span does not agree with Reviola, but again, who knows, things are found out. Uh, we find out things later that, that may change our opinion. How do we know that this is the area of Yehud? So from two different sources, okay? One is from the archeology, span right? We have, settlements that we can date that go back to the Persian period, not so many, but some, but perhaps even more important, we have these handles, right? Now, you may recall when we talked about King Hezekiah, he had special handles that were called lamelech handles, and this was how you paid your taxes. You gave a certain number of barrels of oil, of wine, of whatever, right? Clay jars, really, not barrels. Uh, and, and, the, and the handles on them said lamelech, to the king, for the king. The Persians had a similar thing, except their handles don't say lamelech. They say in the old Hebrew writing, yahud or yahad. You can, or actually here it's in the new writing, yud hey dalid. Okay, um, I think it's in both actually. Um, and wherever we find these handles, that tells us that there was settlement in the Persian period. And we find these handles exactly in these areas that we are talking about here. Okay, so you can see actually on the map it says that wherever there's a circle. This is, um, this is an area where these seal impressions, where these handles were found. Okay, so that tells us one thing. The other thing is that in the book of Nehemiah, we have a very detailed list of all of the people who helped to build the walls around Jerusalem. As we're going to see, one of Nehemiah's big challenges is rebuilding the walls around Jerusalem. And each group, each village, let's say, or the villagers, had a different part that they were responsible for. So I just brought you one little piece here. Hanun and the inhabitants of Zanoach repaired the valley gate. Malchiah, the son of Rechav, chief of the districts of Beit Akaret, repaired the Dung gate. Shalom was chief of the district of Mitzpah, repaired the fountain gate, right? So when we put down, if you, you map out all these places that are listed in the book of Nehemiah, you get a map that looks very like the map that I just showed you before, right? So that's, that's actually very helpful. Helpful, helpful in helping us to understand where is this province of Yehud. Um, something that's been done much more recently in archaeology, very recently in archaeology, is excavations that were done at Ramat Rachel, which is in the southern edge of Jerusalem, um, where we found a, a very large royal complex, which Originally, archaeologists thought it was a royal complex of the Judean kings. Today, the new excavators think it's much more likely, and uh, we talked about this a few classes ago, that it was a complex built first by the Assyrians, then used by the Babylonians, right? And that there's differences of opinion, but pretty much everybody agrees that there's a layer from the Persian period. And what we're looking at here are as a whole, like a water complex, a pool, and aqueducts, and part of royal gardens that you don't see in the picture. Right? But this was built by the Persians, and we found many, many, many of these Yahud handles in Ramat Rachel. And this seems to have been the, the Persian administrative center uh, in, in the area of Jerusalem, right? It's not Jerusalem because it's south of Jerusalem. Um, 
but it's in the area of Jerusalem. This was a very, very exciting discovery because as I said before, we don't have a lot from this time period. And we don't have a lot at all in terms of archeology span or literature. Now, archeology span is easy to understand. This is a picture of um, the Holy Land model of Jerusalem uh, in, in the Israel Museum today, right? And this is Jerusalem at the end of second temple times. Okay? And, and here's our you know, Herodian temple and the very beautiful city. Uh, uh, and the reason I brought this picture is because of the massive building of first the Hasmoneans and then, of course, Herod, who builds on a, a, an unheard of scale, everything that was there earlier and in the Persian period, they did not build in a very, very serious manner because they had a great shortage of both manpower and money. So everything they built was not in the greatest of shape. So either it fell apart or it was destroyed by Herod. He doesn't care about preservation. Nobody cared about preservation in the old days. And so he just came along and got rid of it and built his stuff on top. So we have very, very little archaeology from this earlier period. And literature, we also don't have a lot, right? We have from the very beginning, right? We have our text, Ezra, Nehemiah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. We have uh, the Roman historian Herodotus who writes about the Persian kings. After that, very, very, very little that's written, okay? We hear about Alexander the Great coming and conquering, and then we don't have practically anything until the time period of the Maccabees. So this is a, a period that has a lot, is very much a missing link. Now we're starting to find a little bit more in archeology, span like in Ramat Rachel, in the city of David, but we're still waiting for more discoveries. Hopefully one day we will find them. Okay, so we're gonna take a look now for the next few slides uh, at the prophets, okay? We've got these three final prophets, okay? And this is the end of prophecy, right? As the Gemara say, after, uh, from the time of the destruction of the temple, prophecy is only given to fools. So if you're feeling like you're prophesizing, it's not a good thing. Um, but we have these last three prophets that are kind of tagged on to much earlier prophets in this book this compendium of the 12 prophets, the Treasar. But these guys are separate. Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. Haggai, Zechariah, we can date very exactly because in their books themselves, they tell us when they are writing, they are writing in the time of King Darius, um, the time period when the temple has been stopped and now it's being rebuilt, okay? Malachi is a little bit more mysterious. Even his name is mysterious, Malachi, right? My angel, my messenger. We don't know 100% who he is, but based on the things he's writing about in his language, he seems to fit with this time period as well. Now, uh, a major message of all three of these prophets is you are living through hard times it is very clear that things are difficult now, but you have to look past those obstacles to the glorious future that's going to be here. Okay. Um, and, and that's a very powerful message. It's not an easy message to heed, right? And to listen to because you're living in the time that you're living in. But they say, no, 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 you're going to see it's all going to work out. Maybe not in your lifetime, but it's all going to work out. So here we are back in our Kivreha Nevi'im. Okay, our Tomb of the Prophets, which is actually just a super cool cave that you go down into, and it's got all these burial niches around the walls. Sadly, it is not the cave uh, of, Zahar, of Haggai and Malachi. It is a burial cave whose earliest burials go back to late Second Temple times, but most of the, the, the people who are buried in this cave are Byzantine Christians who died on a pilgrimage to Jerusalem, and they were buried in Jerusalem. Why does it get the name of Haggai and Malachi? It's a good question. It, it's a, it's a, originally a Christian tradition, which the Jews kind of adopted. It's not them, <laughs> but it's a good place to, to talk about them. So uh, one of the messages of Haggai, right? Uh, Haggai is living in this time where the work on the temple has stopped and then it's permitted again, right? But when it's permitted again, people are reluctant to start to build because they're living in very uncertain times. The economy is in terrible shape. The security situation is in terrible shape. And they're saying, it's not time right now. Right? It's not time for it right now for us to build a temple. Uh, and Haggai attacks them. And this is what he says, right? And the word of the Lord through the prophet Haggai continued, right? He, he, he quotes the people saying, it's not the time to build. And he says, is it a time for you to dwell in your paneled houses while this house is lying in ruins? Thus said the Lord of hosts, consider how you have been faring. 
you have sowed much and brought in little. You eat without being satisfied. You drink without getting your fill. You clothe yourself, but no one gets warm. And he who earns anything earns it for a leaky purse, right? You're never making a living. It's just not working. So you say, how can I give charity now? How can I build a temple now? I'm barely making enough to put food on the table. And God says, no, you've got it backwards. Thus said the Lord of hosts, consider how you have fared. Go to the hills and get timber and rebuild the house. And I will look on it with favor and I will be glorified, said the Lord. You have been expecting much and getting little. When you brought it home, I would blow on it because of what? Because of my house, which lies in ruins while you all hurry to your own houses, right? His message is, if you worry about God, God will worry about you. God will take care of you. You are, have to look at it in a different way. And, and the other very strong message that Haggai gives is a very unbelievable message, right? He says, The glory of the latter house will be greater than the glory of the former house. Okay, the former house, of course, is Solomon's temple. This is a, an artistic, a rather fanciful, artistic rendition of Solomon's temple, right? And he says, your house, that the second temple is going to be greater than the first temple. Now, we know that to be true, right? And that's why I brought you this picture again of Herod's temple. But in Haggai's time, that's completely just unbelievable to people, especially we have this, this incredibly powerful passage in the book of Ezra, which says when they're dedicating the second temple, the old men who remembered Solomon's temple, right? Remember, it's not that many years past. This is not in the time of Ezra. This is the time of, uh, of Zerubbabel. They remember Solomon's temple and they look at this temple and they cry, right? Because the temple in the early parts of Shivat Zion times is very, very minimal because they don't have money. They don't have manpower. They have security concerns. But Haggai says, no, no, no it's really going to be greater. You have to believe me that it's going to be greater. And we'll talk about this a little bit at the end, but it really is, right? The end of Second Temple times, the city of Jerusalem is at its height, it's as big as it's going to be until the 19th century, okay, the late 19th century. The temple is glorious, the economy is booming. Spiritually, they're not doing so well, but uh, on a physical level, it's definitely a much more glorious house. And Haggai says this to the people, but it's very hard for them to believe it. Now, Zechariah is, uh, is an interesting prophet, right? He's, he's, he's the longest of these three, okay? Uh, Haggai and Malachi are very short books. Zechariah has a full 14 chapters, a lot of which are uh, about eschatological visions, about the end of days. Um, and, and he places this end of days, by the way, where is it going to happen before this incredible, there's going to be this incredible battle in the city and many people are going to be killed and exiled. It's very terrible. And after this battle, the Lord will come forth and make war on those nations. And that Day, he will set his feet on the Mount of Olives, and the Mount of Olives shall split from east to west. One part of the mountain shall shift to the north, one to the south, a huge gorge, right? There's going to be this enormous earthquake. The Mount of Olives is going to split in half, right? This is going to be Yom Hashem, the day of the Lord that you don't want to see. The Gemara says, I hope that the day of the Lord is going to come, but I don't want to see it. Right? And after the Mount of Olives splits in half, you're going to have something even more unbelievable. In that day, fresh water shall flow from Jerusalem, part to the eastern, right, Dead Sea, part to the western sea through the summer and the winter. Right, There's going to be water coming out of Jerusalem, already an incredible sight, and it's going to heal the Dead Sea. Right, You have Jerusalem, which is the city of, of righteousness and of, of good deeds and of kindness, and it's going to bring the water down to the Dead Sea, down to the area of stone right? This place of evil and of, of stinginess and of, uh, of people destroying each other. And Jerusalem is going to heal the Dead Sea. And I brought this other picture here just because it, it was an amazing thing in um, the year before the pandemic in 2019. It was also a, a year like this year, a very good rain. Um, and the, the Dead Sea, everything by the Dead Sea started to flower. And it, it just seemed to be a fulfillment of this prophecy of the Dead Sea coming back to life. Uh, the other things didn't quite happen the way we wanted, but uh, but that was an amazing thing. Now, a few other things that Zechariah, um, messages of Zechariah, one of them is this enduring image, right? And this is what we read our, our Haftorah uh, on Hanukkah, right? Uh, and he says, the angel talked to me and said, what do you see? And he says, I see a menorah with seven lamps and by it are two olive trees, one on the right and one on the left. And I, Zachariah, 
asked the angel, what does it mean? And he says, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, said the Lord of hosts. All right. Uh, um, and, and this is this, this uh, message that while we might not be powerful in a military sense, we have the, uh, the ultimate power behind us. Right? Now, uh, in 1949, after the War of Independence is over, Israel held a competition to uh, have a symbol of the state of Israel, the new state of Israel. Uh, and this design was submitted, right? the menorah, the seven branch menorah with the olive branches on each side. The designers say they were not inspired by the words of Zechariah, but I think that even if it was on a subconscious level that they remember hearing this or learning it in Hebrew school, because it, it is the image that is talked about here, right? Right? The, the menorah on either side, uh, flanked on either side by the olive branches. And this, of course, is the symbol uh, of the state of Israel today. Uh, and one final message from Zechariah, right? And again, this goes back to the same idea. You're living in a time where Jerusalem doesn't have a lot of people in it. The walls are broken down. You're not safe. Everything looks very bleak. But God says there will be old men and women in the squares of Jerusalem, each with staff in hand because of their great age. And the squares of the city shall be crowded with boys and girls playing in the squares. Now, the city of Jerusalem, after the Six Day War, used this very beautiful verse. They put it on the wall of a square in the old city, Bate Machsa Square. Many people probably know where it is. Uh, and uh, it's a square that happens to be adjacent to not one, but two elementary schools. And if you're there at recess, there's always a million kids running around in the square. And here you are. The city will be crowded with boys and girls uh, playing in the, in the streets, playing in the squares. So that's Zechariah, again, looking past what there is today. Okay, and our, our last prophet that we're going to look at is Malachi. Um, and he talks about uh, a different problem, not about uh, not having faith in God, but not being willing to do for God as much as you're willing to do for your earthly ruler. And this is similar to what Haggai says. We have to worry about what's going on on earth. We, we can't worry about God, right? Uh, and he says, a son should honor his father and a slave his master, master. If I am a father, where is the honor due me? If I am a master, where's the reverence due me? Oh, priest who scorn my name. And you ask, how have, you, how have we scorned your name? Right? Malachi is very interesting because he uses this kind of question and answer form. Um, you offer defiled food on my altar, but you ask, how have we defiled you? He says, by saying the table of the Lord can be treated with scorn. You present a blind animal for sacrifice, right? It, it, you give an animal that has a mum, that has something wrong with it. When you present a lame or a sick one, it doesn't matter. Offer it to your governor, right? Give it to the governor. Will he accept it? Will he show you favor? Would you ever dare to give these blemished animals to the governor of the province? Of course you wouldn't. Why do you think it's okay to give it to God? Uh, and the picture that I brought you here are some of the earliest coins, certainly in our area. Uh, and these are coins of the Yehud province, right? And we're worried about giving coins to the governor, but we're not so worried about giving them to God. Um, and finally, Malachi, the, the, prophets, the prophets end, right? The, the, all the prophets that we have uh, end with Malachi, and it ends with a very beautiful message uh, of re reconciling the generations on the one hand, as well as informing us that one day, Elijah's going to come and he's going to foreshadow the Messiah, right? Uh, we all know the words. I brought it in English, but we know it in Hebrew. I will send the prophet Elijah to you before the coming of the awesome, fearful day of the Lord. This is the origin of the idea that Eliyahu is going to come first and then he's going to announce that the Mashiach is going to come. And what's one of the things he's going to do? Very important. He will reconcile parents with children and children with parents so that when I come, I will not strike the whole land with utter destruction, right? And Eliyahu reconciling the fathers and the sons that fits very nicely with what we talked about in our Eliyahu class, right? About how he has to come back and do a tikkun and, and uh, speak up for the... Um, 
the kvod haben, right? The, the respect of the son of the people of Israel and not only the respect of the father. So here's our Eliyahu's chair at a brit, right? Reconciling the fathers and the sons. The other picture that I brought you here uh, is a picture from a synagogue in the old city. It's a Rabban Yochanan ben Zakai synagogue. Um, by tradition, it is the place that Eliyahu is gonna come to when he's coming to announce the Messiah. And that's why high up uh, on a window right near the ceiling, there's a glass shelf that has on it two things, a shofar, because Eliyahu is going to come, he's going to blow the shofar to tell us that the Messiah is coming, and a jar of oil so that he can anoint Mashuach, right? He can be Mashiach, the Mashiach, right? He can anoint the Mashiach, anoint the Messiah. So that's Malachi. Okay, let's go back to our um, our issue of uh, who stayed behind, who returned, who came back, okay? Um, as we mentioned before, um, the ones who stayed behind are the poorest of the poor, okay? Uh, they are not the elite. The elite goes to Babylonia. They're not the elite either from the kings or from the priests or on an economic level, um, but they stay behind and they hold on to the land, right? And here's our mitzpah again. Um, and in some ways, they almost revert back to the way things were before, right? Before there was uh, the temple in Jerusalem, before the time of King David and the Davidic line, right? They, they, and they're taking care of the land and perhaps coming up with their own traditions or keeping the older traditions. Uh, one of the groups that stays behind uh, and, and is very proud of staying behind are, of course, the Shomronim. The Samaritans that you see over here. Um, and they say, well, we held on to the true way. And you guys went off to the diaspora and abandoned the land. And when the Jews start to come back, okay, according to the book of Nehemiah, the Samaritans and the others who stayed behind want to join with Nehemiah and the returnees to build the temple. And Nehemiah says, Lo lachem vilanu, leave no, 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 we don't want anything to do with you, right? Because what do the returnees say? The people who stayed behind say, well, we held on to the land. Where were you? The people who left say, well, we held on to the Torah. Where were you? Right? And we're going to see that they forge their identity, their Jewish identity, uh, in the diaspora, uh, and they become even more connected and loyal to Torah than they were before. Um, and, and this is a very strong conflict. Um, and the, this is kind of laying the foundations for Jewish history up until today, which is that there is not one community anymore, right? There's a community in the land of Israel. There's a community in the diaspora. As time passes, we have many communities in diaspora. Um, we share many things in common, but we also have many differences among us. Um, and this concept of uh, unity with diversity, right? Diversity within unity, we are all Jews, not the Samaritans, that's already a, a red line. We are all Jews, but we have different approaches and different ways to God or different ways to the Torah. Okay? Even though we have certain things that we have in common, many things that we have in common, that foundation is laid already at this early second temple time. Now, Nehemiah, um, as he tells us, right, Nehemiah's book is largely autobiographical. Um, and he tells us he's serving the Persian king in Shushan, right, Shushan, like in the Purim story. And he hears someone comes back from Jerusalem and he tells him of all the troubles, the wall of Jerusalem is broken and people are in danger. Now, remember, we're almost 100 years after the first groups start to return to the land of Israel. And Nehemiah hears about this and he asks permission of the king, who of course he's his servant. And he says to him, can I go to Jerusalem? Not forever, but you know, for a short time and see if I can help them, okay? And he gets permission and he comes. And one of his first things that he tries to deal with is rebuilding the wall around the city. Now, of course the wall is destroyed um, in the destruction of the temple and the returnees who come, they are not necessarily able to rebuild it all. And what we read, remember we read that, that list of uh, the people who are rebuilding the wall, that's from the time of Nehemiah. That's not from the time of Zerubbabel, right? So he comes back and here he tells us his eyewitness account. I arrived in Jerusalem. After I was there three days, I got up at night 
I and a few men with me and telling no one what my God had put into my mind to do for Jerusalem and taking no other beast than the one on which I was riding. I went out by the valley gate at night towards the jackal spring and the dung gate, right? There are all these places we don't exactly know where they are, right? Today we have a dung gate, but it's not necessarily the same dung gate as the one that Nehemiah has. And I surveyed the walls of Jerusalem that were breached and its gates consumed by fire. I proceeded to the fountain gate in the king's pool, right? The king's pool, we know where it is down here, Shilach, where there was no room for the beast under me to continue. I went up the wadi by night, surveying the wall and entered again by the valley gate. I returned. Now, there are a lot of gates here. And it, it seems unlikely that there would be so many gates in such a small city, but maybe these are just openings in the wall. More or less, we can draw Nehemiah's city looking like this, okay, essentially looking like Solomon's city, but even narrower, okay, where King David and King Solomon's city went all the way down here and then all the way up the Kidron Valley. Let's actually draw that, okay. Um, all the way up the Kidron Valley over here. Nehemiah's city does not. This was all destroyed in the destruction of the first temple and of Jerusalem, and his city is much more narrow. Now, sorry, my hand was not steady. Okay, now he rebuilds the wall, but again, he doesn't build it on such a high level. He doesn't build it particularly well. And in fact, when Elat Mazar was excavating in the city of David, this is the famous area G in the city of David, she actually found a piece of one of the towers that Nehemiah built, right, right, right about here. Okay, um, and she had to dismantle it because it was built so badly it was going to collapse, right? But she was able to date it as going back to the Persian period. So that's one of the things that we have from this time period. So Nehemiah works to rebuild the temple. Another huge challenge that he has is intermarriage. Okay, Ezra and Nehemiah have intermarriage. Uh, the people come and they say to them, you know, suddenly they find out oh, you're not really supposed to marry from the nations around you. Yes, it's in the Torah, but did they follow that so much in? in first temple times, not so much, okay? So they all come and Ezra uh, tells them, you have to get rid of your foreign wives. While Ezra was praying and making confession, weeping and prostrating himself before the house of God, a very great crowd of Israelites gathered about him, men and women and children. And Shechenia, son of Yechiel, spoke up and said, we have trespassed against our God by bringing into our homes foreign women from the people of the land. But there is still hope for Israel. Make a covenant with God to expel all these women and those who have been born to them, right? And that's what they do. And it actually must've been an incredibly awful time, right? Everybody is just breaking away from their wives, from their children, but they believe that this is what they have to do. Now, not everybody does this, right? And at the very end of the book of Nehemiah, we have a story where we only get a tiny little bit of details about it, but Josephus gives us more details that there's actually the son of Yehoiada, the high priest, right? Um, was a son-in-law of Sambalat the Horani. Sambalat the Horani is a Samaritan. Okay. Now, according to Nehemiah, he's a foreigner. Now, Josephus tells us this great story where he says that um, the son of the high priest marries a Samaritan woman. And then Nehemiah says to him, okay, uh, I'm sorry, you can't serve in the temple anymore. Uh, only Josephus doesn't talk about Nehemiah. He dates the story later. And he says he can't serve in the temple. And so his father-in-law, Sambalat, comes to him and says, you know what? I'm going to build you your own temple. And according to Josephus, this is the origins of the Samaritan temple on Mount Grizim. Now, Josephus places the story 100 years after Nehemiah. When we excavated on Mount Grizim, we actually found uh, artifacts that go back to the time of Nehemiah. And the story seems to have taken place in the time of Nehemiah, that we have this final breakaway, uh, that you have a, a temple on Mount Grizim along with the temple on Jerusalem, in Jerusalem. Um, and obviously the temple on Mount Grizim for the Samaritans and those who married with the Samaritans and those who uh, you know, uh, were loyal to them. One more challenge Nehemiah has, doing business on Shabbat. Okay, he sees that people are coming and bringing their wares to Jerusalem on Shabbat and they're starting to sell them. And, and obviously this is not something that is allowed to do and, and he forbids them from coming. Uh, and in order to keep this, this, uh, you know, this law, 
says, when shadows filled the gateways of Jerusalem at the approach of the Sabbath, I gave orders that the doors be closed and not be opened until after Shabbat, right? And some people even came and spent the night outside the walls, right? They, they're so ready to sell and to trade on Shabbat. Now, this is fascinating because what's going on here, what Nehemiah and Ezra, and we're going to see Ezra in one minute, what they're doing is they are creating a religious reform, right? Mm -hmm. They are more... Uh, careful about the laws than the Jews in biblical times were. They go into Babylonia, and in order to retain their identity, they have to become connected to the Torah because they don't have a temple, because they don't have the prophets, they don't have all the things they had in the land of Israel. And so they start to be careful about intermarriage and they start to be careful about Torah reading and they start to be careful about the laws of Shabbat, okay? Uh, and then they come back to the land and they see well, all these other people are not being very careful. We have to institute that and they create a religious reform. Now, Ezra, okay, let's talk about Ezra for a minute, okay? Uh, Ezra is not a, uh, an administrative leader or political leader like Nehemiah. He's a sofer. He's a scribe. Um, he has a, a very, um, a very good lineage. He has a lot of yichus. Okay? And the Gemara talks about how uh, the Torah would have been forgotten until Ezra came from Babylonia and reestablished it. So he is many, many things are ascribed to Ezra, uh, many important things in terms of religious reform and in terms of holding on to traditions and, and making sure the Torah is kept. One of those things is the change in writing, right? Fascinating. Um, the Gemara is very aware that there are two scripts. There's what we call the Ketav Ivri, the old writing, and there's what we call the Ketav Ashuri, the Ashuri script, the way we write letters today. Okay? And there's a disagreement in the Gemara. Was the Torah given in the in the Ivri script or in the Ashuri script, right? And they're very aware. We will not go into that discussion, but I will say that in archaeology, everything from first temple times is in the old script. Um, most things, although not all, from second temple times is in the new script. But what the Gemara does say is that Ezra is the one who comes along and makes the change. Maybe the Ten Commandments were given in the, in the Ashuri script, but nobody else was writing that. And Marzutra says, initially the Torah was given to the Jewish people in Ivrit script and the sacred tongue Hebrew. It was given to them again in the days of Ezra in Ashuri script and the Aramaic tongue. So the, the language, not the language, but the letters change. The language also, they speak more Aramaic, but they're obviously also speaking Hebrew. Another very, very significant development um, that Ezra does is to encourage more and more Torah reading. And again, the Gemara as a whole discussion was started by Moshe and only renewed by Ezra, but Ezra is the one who comes along and says, we have to read the Torah on a regular basis. Now in the book of Nehemiah, we hear about Ezra reading the Torah to the people. Right, and that kind of sparks this religious reform. The entire people assembled as one man in the square before the water gate, and they asked Ezra to bring the scroll of the teaching of Moses. On the first day of the seventh month, Ezra brought the teaching before the congregation, men and women, all who could listen with understanding, and he read from it from the first light till midday to the men and the women and those who could understand. The ears of all the people were given to the scroll of the teaching, and this is kind of the the push to have this religious reform. The Gemara takes this idea and says, Ezra instituted a regular reading of the Torah. Okay, the sages taught that Ezra the scribe instituted 10 ordinances, that the communities read the Torah on Shabbat in the afternoon and also on Monday and Thursday. So you never have three days without Torah reading. You won't forget the Torah. Okay, and the courts convene and judge every Monday and Thursday and you do laundry. Okay, we won't go into all the other ones, right? Which we don't keep as much. Uh, but definitely the Torah reading is one that has lasted. And Ezra is definitely seen as somebody who renews Torah life and, and revitalizes and makes it more than it was before. The picture, I just had to find a picture of someone reading Torah, but I love this picture because it was a picture uh, from 1948 uh, of Torah reading in the field by soldiers, which brings us to our very last point um, and a kind of a nice way to finish this series. Um, in a lot of ways, modern Zionism shares many things with Shivat Sion. Okay? And I will just you know touch on this in one or two highlights, but you really could talk about it more. Okay? And the obvious parallel I brought 
brought you here was between Cyrus uh, and the Balfour Declaration, right? Cyrus proclaims and the Jews come back. Um, Lord Balfour on November 2nd, 1917, writes a letter to Lord Rothschild. Uh, we all know the letter is Majesty Government view with favor the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people. Now, of course, just like the story didn't end with the Balfour Declaration and we had 30 more years of fighting and struggle until we even were handed a state by the United Nations and then more fighting and struggle to actually be able to have that state. Same thing with Cyrus. He allows us to come back. That doesn't mean that we didn't have troubles uh, along the way. Uh, and so many things are similar. The security issues, the economic issues, the fact that you have this very large and thriving and cosmopolitan diaspora right, in, in the time of Shivat Zion, in Persia and in Babylonia and, and in modern times, uh, the Jews of Europe and eventually the Jews of America also. And, and this tiny little backwater uh, in the land of Israel that eventually the, the glory of the latter house will be greater than the glory of the former house. Um, so let's take a look and see what comments people have. And if anybody wants to ask questions. Um, okay, not questions. Um, how do I how do you contact me? Contact me through my website. I'll put my email in again. Do we have questions here? This is all sources. Um, may it quickly lead to a new series. Thank you. Um, their bodies gashed means like um, like you know, in a sign of mourning, which is not such a Jewish thing, but certainly was done by ancient peoples that they would cut themselves to show that they were mourning. Um, what are the reactions of those taken to Babylonia? That's a very interesting question. I don't think we have the reactions. We have the reaction of, uh, of Yechezkel to the destruction of the temple. But I don't think we have anywhere written what happens with the story of Gedalia. It's very interesting, but Gedalia we only hear about uh, in the book of Jeremiah. Um, and they don't go to Babylonia, by the way, they go to Egypt, right? Were all the Kohanim sent into exile? We don't know anything about all, but it seems likely, right, that they are the ones who are singing the songs of Zion and et cetera. Um, the first generation kept their names in exile, but the second generation, yes, I think they do because the Babylonians retain their connection to Judaism. Now, obviously, we get to the Gemara and we hear about people like, you know, Marukva, right? There are all different kinds of names, but the Jews in the land of Israel also have all kinds of names that are very Greek and Roman. Uh, we even have a Rabbi Ishmael, who's a pretty important guy, right? So names do evolve, um, but it, we still have some kind of a connection. Um, perhaps it was scribes writing and codifying the Torah. I don't know what that was connected to, sorry. Um, was Israel important for the persons regarding their wars with Greece? I have to say, I don't know so much. My husband's actually reading Herodotus now, so I'll have to ask him. Um, but I would think yes, right? Because they need an outlet to the sea. But I, I don't want to um, I don't want to answer without really knowing. Is that Torah a form of prophecy? Oh, ask Rabbi Kalman to have somebody give you a class on that. I will not be that person. Um, uh, okay, by the rivers of Babylon, of course. The synagogue is where the rabbis of the old city first celebrated Yom Ha'atzmaut in 1948. Are we talking about uh, Yochanan ben Zakkai? Yes. Yes, not. I don't know if that's true. Um, Nehemiah's description allows us to nearly pinpoint the tombs of the kings. Maybe, maybe not. We don't really know where everything is, right? Expelling the foreign women and children rather than converting them and bringing them in the fold. Yes, Nehemiah is very, very, um, very, very strict. He's very, very harsh. Uh, and whenever I read that verse where he says to the to the out to the those who remained, right, mm, it's not for you and us to build the temple together. I always think, well, what if he had been a little softer, right? Maybe we would have had fewer internal conflicts. Maybe that wasn't such a good answer. On the other hand, he's fighting a very insidious enemy. He doesn't want to go back to the way it was before. He doesn't want to accommodate because accommodating is a big problem. Um, Okay, the letter I in, yes. Thank you to everybody. Are these all thank yous. Thank you so much, everyone. That's so nice. Um, okay, if there are no more questions, yes, Fatya, you want to add something? Was yeah, Nehemiah our first politician? Learning what? there wasn't any conversion 
at that point. Things That's were, also a very interesting more, question, but you could have had a conversion like root, right? But, but, it, but it was a matter of, of place making the, the religion. And, and, what, and if people didn't want, they, they had it their way, it was very dangerous and there was no, it was no acceptance of, of uh, non-Jews for a period I, of time. I think that Nehemia felt that he had to be very, very harsh or it wouldn't work. Um, why is Nehemia not favored by the rabbis? I'm not sure why you say that. Why do you say Nehemia was not favored by the rabbis? Donnie, who wrote that, if you want to speak up, yes. if you are still here. Yes. I'm still oh, you here. are here. Hi. <clears throat> no, I understand the rabbis looked with disfavor on him as being very self-centered and uh, not being as uh, as strict as Ezra. And actually, in the census that he took, he included uh, non-Jewish spouses. And his That's interesting. I don't know what source you're referring to in terms of that they look down on him. I will say Ezra is definitely the figure that everybody looks up to, right? right? Nobody says Nehemiah came from the okay. diaspora and brought the Torah back. But I don't know if they look down on him. I'd be curious to see what you're quoting. Oh, I, I think the book, there's a book about Nehemiah by the American rabbi politician. What's his name? Uh, I'm sorry, it escaped. Oh, so me. many. Lord no, no, Zakai. it's a recent book about Nehemiah, Zakai. and he quotes uh, Zakheim. Somebody say Zakheim. And Zakheim, yes. And, oh, okay, and I'll they, look it up. I don't they know. Chastise it. Him for, um, uh, they, 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 they chastise him for when he responded to the Sukkot, saying it had not been celebrated since the time of Joshua. Correct. As though he was uh, criticizing or demeaning uh, the Jewish people. So um, interesting, although yeah, no, I mean, that is wonderful... something to be demeaned. That's a problematic thing not to have Sukkot. Well, well, actually, it's interesting because Sukkot was celebrated in the temple, but with Nehemia, it was celebrated in the home. And, right. and this is captured... part of all this change. Right, change or actually keeping the laws the way they were supposed to be. I'll have to look at the book. I haven't heard of it, but thank right. you. But truly, um, the, it, it is definite about the synagogue because it's in Shai Shul Cohen's biography. You know, Chief Rabbi of Haifa who died. Ah, okay. Well, the I mean, synagogue was oh, destroyed. Oh, no. The yes, synagogue at the that. time was yes. destroyed, but they could it have was. gone back into the oh, structure. It's all in the book. And his, his wife just died and I contributed to the Shloshim. So I wouldn't make it up, surely. I don't put anything No, no, on, of course just, not. I would never no, say no, such No, no, it's a lovely book. And it's in here. You could read it in Ivrit. I mean, it's a lovely book. It's called Between War and Peace. And he was the first chief rabbi. He was also the first army chaplain in Israeli history, IDF, in the Jordanian prisoner of war camp, sent by his brother-in-law, Rabbi Goran. Who was ah, the interesting. Rabbi. You'd love it. You'd absolutely love it. But it's definitely. Thank you. And it was underneath in the basement that they did the Hallel. And these were really Haredi rabbis. Really yeah, Haredi. Of but they did Hallel for Yom Atzimut when then they heard Ben Gurion on the radio announcing the state. It's really amazing. What in beautiful, between gunfight. Beautiful, it's just beautiful story. Julie, I love your. Thank election. you for making Brilliant. that connection. It's all right, love. All the best. Have a lovely Pesach, everybody. Thank okay, you so thank much. Thank you, everybody. Uh, have a wonderful Bye. Chag. And don't worry, we will meet again. I don't know uh, what we're going to do. If you have any good ideas, send them to me. I'm happy to hear. Put your email on uh, in oh, the. Oh, my email. Chat. Yes, I will put my and email we, uh, here. We have a session next week. Yes, next week we have a Pesach. That's true. I have not gone so fast. You're right. You haven't gotten rid of me, but <laughs> a different, a different topic. All right. That I put my email on and I'm going to end the session. So if you want to copy it, do it now. Um, thank you, everybody. Shabbat Shalom. Thank you. Shuri. Shabbat Shalom. Thanks. Thank you for a wonderful course. Thank you. Thank you so much.